This lesson is a higher level only lesson, and it's um, part of the paper three, the quantitative paper. And we're going to look at how to draw a linear demand curve and a linear supply curve, and uh, how to find the market equilibrium. I'll, tr I'll be giving you tips on what uh, a paper three would be expecting in terms of showing your work. Um, labeling the axes and so on. And this really isn't re um, any more difficult than probably grade nine math, but you will see that economists have, um, have switched up the axes and switched up the equation, so it's a little bit different. So I'll point out the differences between how you learn to graph a straight line with the y equals mx plus b, where the m is the slope, um, and how that is similar and dissimilar to economics. So how to draw a linear demand curve? So we have it in the form that QD equals A minus BP. So in other words, we could have QD equals, let's say, 10 minus 2P, just as an example to put numbers into it. Um, A is a quantity that would be demanded if the price were zero. So if, um, if, if price were zero, so if, if B was zero, um, that would fall out of the equation. And then the quantity demanded would simply equal A. Um, so that's why it's the quantity that would be demanded if the price was set at zero. And here it is on the graph there. B sets the slope, just like when you saw Y equals MX, um, MX plus C. No, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, y equals MX plus Sorry about that, B. Anyway, M here sets the slope, the coefficient to the X, and here the coefficient to P sets the slope. But we're going to see that um, there is a difference in terms of what happens as B gets larger and larger compared to what, what you've learned previously in math. B is shown as a negative, so we see the negative here, because it is an, um, because of the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So if you think of the law of demand, as price increases, quantity demanded decreases, or as price decreases, quantity demanded increases. So it moves in inverse um, directions, and so we see that the, um, the demand curve is sloping downwards. You see that here. And so it is minus BP. So let's plot uh, this particular demand function where QD equals 500 minus 10P. So we're going to look at several different methods, but one could be do, to do a table of values and use these values to plot the curve. So I've done the first one for you. The next one would be 500 minus 10 times 10, which would equal 500 minus 100, which would be 400. The next one being 500 minus, um, sorry, 10 times 20. So that's going to equal 500 minus 200, which would be 300. And then 500 minus 10 times 30, which would be 500 minus 300 which would be 200, and lastly, 500 minus 10 times 40, which is 500 minus 400, which equals 100. And of course, you can see the pattern that quantity demanded is going down by 100 for each $10 increase in price. So let's plot the demand function, um, or oh, as I was saying, so excuse me, method two. You know that the demand function is linear. There's no exponents, there's no square roots, nothing to sort of mess it up. So it's very similar to that form y equals mx plus b. So if you found where the curve crosses the quantity axis and the price axis, you could plot these two points and connect them with a straight line. This would also help you to determine how to set the units along the axes. So um, so again, sort of just in case you need reference to, to this function of what's going on here, how would you find where the function crosses uh, the quantity axis? So that's here. At this point, what does price equal? Well, we would let P equal zero and solve. 
So we would have QD equals 500 minus 10 times 0. So it would equal 500. And we had also talked about in terms of A, because it's A um, minus BP, the A value sets where it crosses the X axis. So we know that this would be at 500. How would you find out where the function crosses the price axis? Well, at the price axis, we know that quantity is zero. So let QD equal zero and solve. So we have zero equals 500 minus 10 P. And we can see right off the bat that P must equal 50. 50 times 10 would be 500. Uh, solving the equation. So we would have P up here 50. So let's graph that demand function. So first of all, we'll put a zero here. Quantity is on the X axis. Price is on the Y axis. And we noticed that when um, P was zero, our quantity was 500. So let's notch this as 100. 200, 300, 400, and 500. So we know we're dealing with this point. And we know that if, um, if quantity is zero, our price is going to be 50. So let's call this 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So it will go from here. Now you will have a ruler. I don't have a ruler on this um, uh, with this PowerPoint. So you would draw a very straight line connecting those two and then you would label the graph QD equals 500 minus 10 P. Now for some reason the demand curve were to increase by 100 units at every price. We know this would be a shift right of the demand curve by 100 units. So remember, uh, just to, to prove my point, that for the function QD equals A minus BP, A is a quantity that would be demanded if the price were zero. So initially, it, it crossed the x-axis at 500. But now, because it's increased by 100 units at every price, including zero, um, where it crosses the x-axis would now be 600. So the graph will now start at 600 on the quantity axis. So the new function we know is going to be QD equals 600 minus 10P. The value of A, where it crosses the X axis, has increased by 100. So let's graph this new function. Well, we could do a table of values. We could find where the curve intersects the quantity axis and the price axis. We could shift the original graph over by 100 units to the right. I vote for method three. I'm uh, a bit lazy and it will be a lot faster than the other two methods. So here's our original graph. We're going to take two points and shift it over by 100. So here's one. And let's take uh, this and shift this over by 100. We could take that point or we could take this point. We're going to draw it parallel. Again, you'll have um, a ruler, I don't. And then of course, we're going to label it QD equals 600 minus 10 P. And we had this shift to the right. So at every price point at $50, we're now demanding 100 more units. At $30, we're now demanding the 100 more units and so on. In the original example, QD equals 500 minus 10 P. Demand, so the QD, falls by 100 every time the price changes by $10. It, <clears throat> excuse me, we saw that from the table of values that we did uh, right off the bat. I said there's a, a pattern happening and see how the quantity is falling by 100. If the value of B, so this number here, was 20, then the demand would fall by 200 every time that price changed by $10, and the demand curve would be flatter. So I just want to draw your attention to y equals mx plus b. You were taught that in uh, grade 9 or so, that as the value of m gets larger, 
that this curve is going to become steeper. But as this gets larger, this gets larger. And if you think of what's happening, this is rather mathematical. You'll never be asked to explain this in a uh, in in a IB exam. But if the uh, coefficient's getting larger, it's getting pulled along the y-axis that much more, and so the function's becoming steeper. Well, in um, economics, they've kind of reversed the independent and dependent axes and also the way that they write the function. So here they have quantity, and here they have price. So what's happening is as um, if we increase the coefficient here, then the value of QD is going to get greater. And where do we see the quantity? It's on the x-axis. So it's being pulled along the x-axis, making it flatter. Anyway, the main thing to realize is that um, the coefficient, the number in front of the P, so in other words, um, the QD equals A minus BP, so the value of B, as that coefficient gets larger, the function gets flatter. And so it is the opposite of what happens when you learned in, um, in grade nine or so. So let's do a demand schedule for this new function, minus 20p instead of minus 10p, and we'll plot it on the original graph. So here we'll have QD equals 500 minus 20 times 10, which is 500 minus 200, so this is going to be 300, so the quantity demanded is falling faster now than before. And lastly, 500 minus 20 times 20, which is 500 minus 400, which is 100. And you can see the pattern here that it's falling by 200 each time, so it's falling even more dramatically. So when we go to graph this, we know that uh, if compared to the old function, we have the value of A at 500. So this is the value where it crosses the x-axis. The value here is the same. So we know that our new function is going to start at the same point. But our slope is going to be different. The value of B is greater. So are you going to expect it to be steeper or flatter? it's going to be flatter um, because the value is greater. Remember, it's being pulled along the x-axis. So we need to find a second point. Um, so let's say if P was $40 or $30, we would, no, let's try 20. Let's try 20. So 500 minus 400 would be 100. So 20 and 100. And so if we connect that graph, there it is there. We'll label, label it, excuse me, QD equals 500 minus 20P. So we see that it started at the same point because the value of A was the same, but the curve itself is flatter. So in summary for this demand function, the function of A is um, the value Uh, where the function, I'll say meets rather than crosses because we never really deal with uh, negative, we don't deal with negative quadrants uh, for, demanding, for demand and supply function. So the value where the function meets the x-axis, in other words, the quantity. If A changes, and only A, so not B, the function moves parallel. To the original, to the original function by A units. So if um, if A were to be negative, it will move to the left if demand has decreased for some reason. If A is positive and the product's in, in more uh, demand, then it will move to the right by A um, units. The function of B is to set the slope. If only B changes, then the x-intercept stays the same.
and the slope changes. If B increases, it becomes flatter. If B decreases, the function becomes steeper. So the exact opposite to what you learned in math. Now we're going to look at drawing the linear supply function. Um, many of the, the same principles are the same as the demand function. Um, so we'll pick up the speed a little bit here. Um, but you, and you'll see the similarities. So now we say C plus DP. It has a positive um, relationship between price and quantity supplied. So think as price increases, quantity supplied increases. As price decreases, quantity supplied decreases. And so we've got this direct relationship. So once again, C is going to be that quantity supplied if the price was zero. So in other words, um, well, often it doesn't cross the x-axis. And D sets the slope of the curve. So again, the coefficient in front of the P. As with the demand function, the greater the value of D, this coefficient, the flatter the curve. And the smaller the value, then the steeper. So let's look at um, doing a table of values for this particular function here. So let's look at price being 1. So we would have, um, sorry, negative 20 plus 10 times 1, which would equal 10. Then we'd have negative 20 plus 10 times 20, excuse me, 10 times 2, which would be 0. Negative 20 plus 10 times 3, so negative 10, 20 plus 30 would be 10. Negative 20 plus 10 times 4, so negative 20 plus 20 would be 20. And the last one, negative 20 plus 10 times 5, so negative 20 plus 30, excuse me, plus 50 would be 30. And again, you can see that it's, I'm so sorry, this is a negative 10 here, that it's increasing by 10 each time. And it's actually good that I went to look at the pattern and I caught my initial mistake here because um, uh, I needed to add in the negative for it to be 10 greater than negative 20. We want to draw a diagram to show the supply curve that uh, we've um, just been using. And so we're going to use that supply schedule. Are you going to include a negative quantity supplied because we had negative 20 and negative 10? can't really think how you can realistically account for a negative quantity supplied, so the answer is no. So we're going to ignore those um, values. I'm going to, um, well, first of all, we have to set the axes. We went up to a price of 5, so we could, let's see, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and our maximum quantity was 30. So again, we could make this 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And so at a price of $2, uh, we had a quantity of zero. And at a price of five, we had a quantity of 30. Again, you will have a ruler. I'm not going to go into the negative. Um, I'm going to connect these two dots, label the curve. So we're dealing with QS equals negative 20 plus 10p. And again, uh, I just want to emphasize price is on the y-axis and quantity is on the x-axis. And just um, another illustration of how the economists mix messed it up or mixed it up. If we look at the function, whether it's the demand function or supply function, so quantity supplied equals negative 20 plus 10p. So in other words, as price changes, the quantity supplied is going to change. So which would you think is the independent and dependent variable? Well, price would be the independent. You would expect it to be on the x-axis, but it's not. And quantity supplied is the dependent because the quantity is going to depend on what's happening to price. But they've put it on the x-axis and on the y-axis, 
you've got your independent variable. Again, not to worry, but um, this won't be asked in an IB exam, but just in case you were curious as to uh, how the two compare, the economists and the mathematicians. So now let's think that there's been a technological improvement and it is possible to produce 10 more units at every price. We know that the function will shift to the right now by 10 units for every price. What would the new supply function be? Well, before we had QS equals negative 20 plus 10P. If it were to cross the x-axis, we know that it would cross it here, but, um, but it doesn't always cross the x-axis, and we'll, we can talk about that uh, um, later. So we know that, that this value here has to increase by 10 units. So the new supply function is going to be negative 20 plus 10, the additional 10 plus 10p. So in other words, tidying it up, negative 10 plus 10p will be the new supply function. So we could uh, fill in a table of values for the new function. So let's just do that quickly. So we would have negative 10 plus 10 times 1, which is going to equal 0. And we could have negative 10 plus 10 times 2 going to equal 10. Negative 10 plus 10 times 3. Negative 10 plus 20, excuse me, plus 30 will be 20. Negative 10 plus 10 times 4, so 30. And lastly, negative 10 plus 10 times 5, 40. So if we look at the new quantity supplied here and we compare it to the old quantity supplied, it has indeed increased by 10 each time from negative 20 to negative 10 and from 30 to 40 and so on. So uh, QS has increased by 10. So we're going to graph the new supply function. Again, are you going to graph any negative amounts like this? And the answer is no. Okay, so if we had um, um, the value, the A, excuse me, not A, we're dealing with supply, we're now dealing with C, this is C, and this is D. The value of C has increased by 10. So again, arbitrarily take two points and move it over by two, and two. It's going to be parallel using a ruler. This has shifted this way by 10 units and then write in the new function minus 10 plus 10 P. So again for a supply curve we use the letters C and D. So C is the quantity that would be supplied if the price was zero and D sets the slope of the curve. Now let's look at calculating the market equilibrium. So we're going to have a product that has a demand function and a supply function shown below. Now I do want to draw your attention to something. We're going to say that the price is in euros and the quantity is in tons per week. Because when you think realistically, when you have a demand and supply curve, what, how much are you selling within what time period? Are you looking at the quantities uh, demanded and supplied in a day, in a week, in a year, in a month? So here we have the answer. It's going to be tons per week. So here are the two functions. So we can do a demand and supply schedule. So let's um, let's look at this. So this would be 2,000 minus 200 times 2. So 2,000 minus 400 would be 1,600. And 2,000 minus 200 times 3. So that's minus 600. So it would be 1,400. And I can see what the pattern is. It's going down by 200 each time. So I'm just going to fill that in. 
Okay, on supply, we've got negative 400 plus 400 times 2. So negative 400 plus 800 will be 400. And here, negative 400 plus 400 times 3, which is 1,200. And the difference between 400 and 1,200 would be 800. Again, I'm seeing the pattern. It's going up by 400 each time. And I'm just going to double check my last one uh, that I've, I haven't made a mistake with how I've jumped times six. So if we had um, if we had 2,400 minus 400, indeed we would have 2,000. So our pattern seems to be correct. So we're going to plot the relevant demand and supply curves. Um, so we need to be really precise in our axes. No longer are we going to just say price because you're going to get a homework assignment um, that is IB style and we want to, to have the precision that the IB is going to demand. So it's going to be price in euros and it's going to be quantity in tons per week. So we want to be very precise. And when we give the equilibrium quantity and um, supplied and quantity demanded, again, we will say that the price is in euros and the quantity is in tons per week. All right, so if we're plotting this um, uh, function, so very quickly, demand if price is zero, oh, we know that um, this is going to set where it crosses x-axis, so we're going to start off here. And if the price were 50, no, sorry, 10, no, my math is terrible here, when would quantity demanded be zero? It would be, no, I have that correct, when price would be 10, we don't have it that far. So let's look at a price of five, at $5, it would be 2,000 minus 1,000, so it would be 1,000 at a price of 5. So we could connect this, again, using a ruler, and we could call this QD equals 2,000 minus 200P. Quantity supplied, well, if price, um, if price were $1, then quantity supplied would be zero. And if um, if the price were six dollars, we would have 2,400 minus 4,000, so we'd have 2,000 at six. Let's use a different color. And again, you would have a ruler, and I don't. So here, this would be QS equals negative 400 plus 400P. Now, I just want to tell you, this uh, is by no means exact enough. You would want to definitely be using a ruler because sometimes the IB might ask you, what, where is the market equilibrium? And having drawn a precise graph, you may be able to read it right off the graph. Here, we can't see a, a precise value, so we certainly wouldn't be able to read our, um, our equilibrium from the graph or check that our answer was right by seeing um, where the two curves met. So you can, you can tell from your graph, not from mine, but where the equilibrium price and quantity are. But this might not always be the case, or you may be asked to calculate the equilibrium price and quantity. In order to calculate the amount, you are looking for where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. So in other words, you're going to set the equations to equal each other and solve for P. So let's do that. Let QD equal QS. And so we'll have 2000 minus 200 P equals negative 400 plus 400 P. Well, I'll, I'll, bring, uh, I'll bring the 400 over, so we'll have 2,000 plus 400, and I'll bring this over, so 400, bring this over to the other side, plus 200p. So I've gotten rid of all the negative numbers as well to make life a little easier. So let's just double check I haven't made a mistake. When this comes over, it's plus 400. When this comes over, it'll be plus 200. 
So we've got 2,400 equals 600p. And so 2,000, excuse me, well, p equals 2,400 divided by 600. So p equals 4 euros. All right, so we found part of our um, equilibrium. Once you have found p, then substitute this amount for p back into either equation and solve for q. So if we use the equation qd equals 2,000 minus 200p and p equals 4, then we've got QD equals 2,000 minus 200 times P. 2,000, I'm sorry, I should have put this as 4, my apologies. Minus uh, 200 times 4 is 800, so we would have 1,200. So the equilibrium quantity is 1,200 tons per week, remember to be precise, and the equilibrium price is four euros. Be careful that the units are correct because you will get uh, dinged marks otherwise. So now let's assume there's been a change in taste against the product. So people are demanding less of it. The demand curve is going to shift left. And the new function is QD equals 1400 minus 200 P. So the new demand schedule would be, so let's do a, a few of these. So we would have 1400 minus 200 times 2. So 1400 minus 400. So we would have 1000. Let's do one more. 1400 minus 200 times 3. So that would be 600. So that would be 800. And 1400 minus 200 times 4, so that would be 800. The difference between the two would be 600. So let's see what's happening. It's going down by 200 each time. So let's just fill that in, 400 and 200. Maybe just double checking the last one. 1400 minus 6 times 200 would be 1200. And lo and behold, that is correct, the 200. So we're going to plot the new demand curve with the original functions, um, which, which are, um, will be on the next, the next slide. So the new function is um, 1400 minus 200p, as we looked at. So we know where it crosses the x-axis will be 1400 now. So this is a decrease of 600 units. Um, so we need to come across 200, 400, 600. So we did that there. Let's take another one. Um, that'd be 200, 400, 600. And we knew that as well because um, from our table of values, we knew that at a price of 6 euros, we'd be selling 200 uh, tons per week. So that would indeed be this point. Again, you would be using a ruler. So this would be QD equals 1400 minus 200 P. We can see that where the new equilibrium is. Again, yours will be more precise than mine. So the new equilibrium, you're going to be asked to calculate it, I believe. And um, if you get an answer of three euros at 800 tons per week, then you know that chances are you've done the, the math correctly because the graph is also showing that. So what do you notice when you compare the two functions? Well, if we look at where it began at the x-axis, the curve shifted left by 600 units. And if you look at the value of the slope, the coefficient in front of the p, or the, um, it's the same. So slope stayed the same. And so because the slope stays the same, you know that it's a, um, a parallel shift. Let's say you're asked to um, calculate the excess supply at the original equilibrium price of $4. So what I would suggest you do, 
Let's go back to one of your graphs. Now it has, um, it is asking for your calculations. So in order to see what's happening, let's find out where $4 is. Let's bring that across. We know that we're going to have one quantity here and one quantity there, and we're being asked to calculate what is the excess supply. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this demand function and find out what this quantity is. Call this Q1. So to find out Q1, we're going to substitute four dollars, or excuse me, four euros. And so we'll have QD equals 1400 minus 200 times four. So in other words, 1400 minus 800, which should be 600. Now, does that look realistic? Yes, it does. Okay, so we've got Q1 equals 600. All right, now we need to decide what this is. This is our old equilibrium. We can use either function. We can either use the old demand function or the supply function because it, it intersects with both. Let's use, let's say, the old demand function. And let's call this Q2. So Q2, um, again, we're going to let P equals 4 euros. And we'll have QD equals 2,000 minus 200 times 4 equals 2,000 minus 800 which would be 1,200. Let's see if that looks realistic. Yes, it does. And so the excess supply is going to be the 1,200 minus 600, which equals 600 tons, again, per week. Does that look realistic? Well, here's 200, 400, 600. It certainly does look realistic. So what will happen to price and why? So again, if we draw in that value of 4, we know that um, price will fall until um, the excess supply Um, disappears. So there we have the price falling until, until this excess su supply here disappears. What will happen to quantity? Well, QS is going to go down since P went down. So we're going to have a movement, and here's the equilibrium, we're going to have a movement along the supply curve reducing QS, and then along the new demand curve, excuse me, along we know that QD is going to go up since price goes down. So again, along the new demand curve, we're going to be moving along it, demanding more in response to the new price. Now, this is the new demand curve, not the old demand curve. And finally, if you were asked, what is the new equilibrium price and quantity? Again, it's helpful to have the, um, the diagram sketched for you because you know that you're looking at this, um, this amount here. So how would you find this out? You would let QD equal QS. You would solve for P and then you would substitute it back into one of the other functions. So we know that we're dealing with this QD we could have called this QD2 and QD1. And we're dealing with this supply curve, the supply function. So we're going to have 1400 minus 200P equals negative 400 plus 400P. Bringing over the amounts, we'll have 1400 plus 400 equals 200P 
plus 400p. And so 1800 equals 600p. So p would equal 1800 divided by 600, which would equal 3 euros. Does that look realistic? Yes, it does if we bring the price over. So now we're going to substitute p equals 3 into either function. I'll deal with the, um, the negative 1400 minus 200 p. So we'll have negative 1400 minus 200 times 3. Excuse me, there's no negative. My apologies. And so we'll have 1400 minus 600, which equals 800. And again, tons per week. And let's look at our graph. At the quantity, yes, it does indeed look like 800. And uh, it looks like we have not made any calculations. Thank you.